All right. So pretty much right. Uh, this is the first JML lecture. Woo! Yeah. Okay, I'm back. Yeah. Hi, Ernest. <laughs> Hello. Um, just remember the fact that this is the first one, right? Um, it's going to be like an iterative process on like not only how these things are run, but also how like I type <laughs> kind of prepare them and stuff like that. Um, so what did you say? Cut out a bit. Wait, hello, test. Yep. Yeah. All right. This is an iterative process on not only how these things are run, but how they're also prepared. Um, so obviously like when I was like preparing with Ernest and like how we like go about like brainstorming the topic and stuff like that and actually preparing everything for it. Um, I'll make some adjustments to it over time and then hopefully by like second or third week it'll like be pretty good. Um, but yeah, just remember like it's just us two. So um, it's not like an overly formal thing, but it's just like trying to present an idea or a concept over to you guys. Um, but that's about it. Um, I guess we'll just get started. Uh, it'd be nice if everyone muted their mic and don't talk until the end. Uh, and then at the end, uh, there'll be like a Q&A or whatever. Um, and then you could just start opening your mics and asking questions one by one. Um, but until then, uh, um, yeah, Ernest, sorry. Um, maybe it's like, if you have a question, right? Oh, uh, I think it's like, we'll have a Q&A. But I feel like if you really have, if you have something like on the spot that you thought about and you want to pose a question, right, then you can like unmute and just like let yourself be heard, I reckon. I, yeah. I think that's good because sometimes you forget things. Yeah, true. That's a good idea. Um, but we'll also yeah. have like a Q&A thing at the end or whatever. So if you guys want to leave it for then and you can remember, save it for then. Um, but other than that, um, I'll, uh, you can take oh, it away, spooky. Ernest. Oh, I'm a bit scared. It's oh. alright. Wait, I have to go in your stream as well. I have That's to look okay. at that. No pressure, dude. Okay. Sorry. I'm just formatting my desktop. But yeah, so if you guys have any questions, like midway through, feel free to just cut in. So, first lesson, stage control. This is really scary. Um, Well, so... I think I want to get this one idea across, right? So the I think fighting games is kind of like a lot about a game of options, right? It's kind of like predicting what your opponent's going to do. If you think if you think about it like two two people, right, have the same amount of options, that's neutral, right? You two people they're both thinking about a multitude of different things. So that brings up the question, what is stage control? I like to think of stage control not just about like, oh, I have center stage, this is pog. It's more like, I have center stage, but that stage allows me to have way more options at my disposal, and my opponent has way less options at their disposal, right? That's kind of what stage control boils down to. So, um, so if you think about it from like the opponent's perspective, look at the, re look at the Ike, right? They have, they have way less options, and they have to account and anticipate way more options, right? So it becomes way harder for the Ike to kind of play, play the game, as opposed to the Fox, where they have to worry about way less things that the Ike can potentially do. So yeah, that's kind of like the main point I want to get across, right? So it's like anticipating multitude of different things. It's like kind of when you're thinking about like five different things at once, right? while under a time constraint. You're way more prone to making mistakes or to making like a bad choice than the guy that has to worry about like two things, right? And they have way, a way lesser time constraint, okay? So next slide is benefits of stage control. So as we've discussed, right? It's like the person that has stage control, when you have stage, you have way more options at your disposal. Your opponent needs to think about a multitude of different things. And that being said, they're way more prone to making mistakes. Oh, wait, I forgot. Um, can we can we go back and go to the GIF? Because we actually had a GIF. So this is this is a classic game. This is Violet MKLA's Violet versus Meister's Game Watch, right? So if you pause here, can you pause? Alright. So this is a classic ledge trapping example, right? But it does it it kind of like moves evolves more than just ledge trapping. It's kind of like a demonstration of 
a game of options, kind of. And like how hard it is for the person, for Meister, to anticipate so many different things. And it kind of exacerbates the importance of stage control. So if you just play the clip, look at Meister. He's shielding. Let's go, shield. Dashes in. Shields a bit more. Oh my god, he's charging fail not. He has to worry about so many different things, right? Because any hit will kill. And then he does this backer and he dies for it. Now you might be thinking, oh my god, that backer is kind of like a bit questionable, right? Like, you're not going to outrange a Bylus. The point I'm trying to make though is that he has to make a... He feels like he has to make a choice. If you're in his position and you feel like so many things are out of my control. So if I have to... if What, what should I do? Should I, make a, should I make an interaction? I'm just going to throw this backer to catch his jump. And it gets outspaced. So it's kind of like exacerbating that idea that there's so many different things that's going on. And that's why stage is so beneficial, right? It's not just solely about like kind of being in the center of the stage and like and like getting points for that. So it's like having so many different options that your opponent has to worry about so many different things at once. Yeah. And on, in addition to that, there's another benefit of stage control that's like kind of like a safety net, right? If you if you look at the slide, you see you can see. So if let's say both players get hit, right? If I got hit while having stage, worst comes to worst, I it's reset neutral. The person that doesn't have stage control has to reset neutral, or like has to get out of disadvantage by resetting neutral, right? He gets a hit, and then the person gets sent away, but they're still on stage. Whereas if I, like me, the person that has stage control hit them, then they're off stage, and they're panicking, right? I'm like Lucina, I'm gonna, I'm gonna edge guard them. It's, it's a really scary time. So that's like the difference of like, kind of like the risk. It's it kind of like exacerbates risk reward is what I'm trying to say. In addition to that, when you have stage control, you also it's like another really important idea to be like, or to think about is like you dictate the flow of the game. You don't have to interact if you don't want to, right? And I'll I'll get on. I'll I'll explain that later. Can we play the tweak Diddy example? So if you look, ooh, so this is a Wi-Fi tournament. If you look at this clip, right? And he dies. All right. Can you can you go back to that to that point? Sorry. Sorry to do this, Connor. And then you just pause. Kind of like maybe put it in like 0 0.5. Yeah. That's good. So pause, pause, pause. So Tweak has stage, right? Look at um, that's Ness. He's at 168%. He has to worry about so many different things, etc. I've already gone over this. Um, the crucial thing is that Tweak has doesn't need to really like interact with him. Like at like he can choose when he wants to interact, right? So it's like about setting the flow of the game, right? And then Best Ness, he's kind of like guessing. Like it's like it's like kind of like he doesn't have the um, benefit of reacting because the space between them is so little and the margin of error is so huge. So if you look, if you just played the clip, look at look at Tweak, he dashes in, he shields, and he rolls away, right? And then Best Ness went for a PK fire to try to hit him where the where Tweak shielded, right? So it's like he's forcing a commitment and then Tweak's Tweak's kind of just like chilling. He's just like he can always move backwards and that's like a huge benefit. And then he gets a he he gets, he essentially gets a good read um, with a with the side B because nest like the nest doesn't have any room to go so he like dashes in dashes out and then he gets side B for it and he dies so that's like kind of like explaining why stage control is so important. Um, here's the next clip. It's like a the wolf example. All right. So if you kind of like just. One, go back, yeah. Alright. So you roll, he... If you look at this, he's just like not interacting at all, right? He has all the stage behind him, and he could potentially go for a read. He could like dash attack Palutina, where she's at. She could like, he could go for like a nair to read a jump. But what Tweet does is that he just like goes back and shoots laser. He doesn't need to play with the opponent if he doesn't want to, right? He has that, he has that luxury. And he eventually loses stage, but it's kind of like highlighting my point where it's like you don't really need to do so much, whereas the opponent kind of has to. They have to come into you, right? So yeah.
So next slide. All right. All right, all right. Um, this is an abstract example, but I just want you guys to like look at the queens, okay? I think you guys kind of know where I'm getting at. And also it's like, I don't really play chess, so like try not to take it too hard, um, but um, too much too hard. But if you look at like the queen on the left, she has so many options, right? She's like the most powerful piece in the game. And being in the center is like generally kind of like better than kind of suffocating the queen in a corner. If you look at her in the right, she can only move two places, right? It's pretty, it's pretty weird term. She can't really express herself. And that's kind of like what I'm trying to explain via stage control, you know? It's like one, one is good, one is bad. Um, but essentially, it's like fundamentally you have less options than your opponent. And essentially, if you look at the examples we played before, if you put yourself in the opponent's, like, sorry, in the person that doesn't have stage control's point of view, they're kind of playing like 50 RPSs at once, right? There's not only the, the, the concern of having to account for 50 different things at once. It's like, if I jump out of the, if I jump, are the, am I going to get anti-aired? If I roll, am I going to get roll red? If I hold shield, am I going to get grabbed? When, is he go when are they going to do this? At what time? They have to think about so many different things. So that's like a huge no-no, right? It's like a bad thing about stage control. Um, it, it's kind of like, we kind of explained the, the cons of it in the previous slide as well, where it's like, if you also get hit, then you're now off stage and it's really scary. But essentially the game kind of is like heavily, the risk reward is heavily skewed in your opponent's favor. And that's the importance of stage control. So the next slide is probably the most important slide that I want to kind of like go over. Next slide, please. And it's how to keep stage control, All right? I think that JML kind of, or like just players, right? They do a good job in gaining stage control because what you do is you essentially win neutral. What differentiates the good players from the like the really good players from like le like worse players? are their ability to just maintain, right? And keeping stage control is probably the thing that I think um, we all need to work on the most. I know I'm really bad at it, and it's kind of like a flaw of my own gameplay. But what I want to talk about is that when you have stage control, a lot of the time you don't really appreciate the idea of having it. If you, let's, look at the, let's look at the image, right? We took that from Banana Boy. Sorry about that. But the Mario, he has stage, he's in an advantage. We've talked about all these different things before, right? So a lot of the time, I would see people like the Mario would just go in. They'd be like, hmm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fully drift in, and I'm going to backer him. And I ask why. And they're like, I just want to hit him, bro. I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, fair call. But if you really think about it, it's like, that's not really like smart. If you decide... Even something as safe, safe as a Mario back here, right? If you decide that you want to go and hit them, you're essentially make, creating a commitment, right? And in that, in that point, if he shields, the Falco can, can fare out a shield, they can roll away, they can escape. You're giving them a, essentially a commitment, kind of like an opportunity that the person on the ledge can escape. And you don't need to do that commitment, right? The, the flow is in your hand. <laughs> the pace of the game is in your hands. You don't need to do anything. The opponent doesn't know that. They have, they're thinking about so many different things. So the likelihood that they will make a commitment is higher, right? And you, you can kind of like, you can kind of bank on that. And good players understand this concept. And what they do is that they just keep the stage. They move in and out. They kind of like, bait the person on the ledge, thinking that they'll commit, and then the person will kind of throw, throw their hand. And then, the, and then the person with stage, who baited that, can capitalize on that, right? What they don't do is that they don't hard commit to anything. Their priority, right, is just maintaining stage. And if they, if they like, throw a move out, their next, their next move is always a dash back, or it's always something to kind of position themselves back in like with having stage and it's like yeah puppets talked about that before um i think the best way to talk about it is to just kind of look at the examples so so you have leo and harvey it's another violet clip clip but i really like violet i'm in like a violet mood anyways pause 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 can you go back like 10 seconds please 
All right, all right, press it, press it. So he gets scroll janks, hate this bitch, gets nared, jab, and then pause. All right, so stage, pog, what does Leo do? I know that if I freeze frame this, and this was me, I'd probably like try to whiff punish Harvey for like fairing with a dash attack, right? Or I'd try to like kind of be closer to him. I'd want to like grab him. I want to just punish him because I saw Harvey do a button and I have a hard on for like punishing people. But what does Leo do? He kind of like holds his center. He shields. Can you play this in 0 0.5? Or 0 0.25. Sweet. That works. He shields. He fares. Pause, pause, pause. Yeah. So he fares, right? And I think that fair was to kind of hit Harvey where he was at. Stop moving. Yeah. Okay. And then Harvey does a good jump, right? But the key factor is that he's still kind of in between Harvey and the center of the stage, right? And then look what he does next. The shield. And he drifts back for the fair, right? At no point did Leo kind of cross between Javi and the center of the stage. Well, actually, like, it's really hard to do that. But I just realized. But at no point does he really fully commit to anything is what I'm trying to say. He never really goes for, like, a hard call out by, like, up airing him or, like, a dash in and grab. And after he, shield, after he does the falling fair and shields, he immediately lets go shield and he drifts back because he doesn't want to stay in a position at once. And then Harvey grabs him because he thought that he, he'd stay shielded, right? And yeah, see, so it's like this priority of maintaining the center and just not committing hard, right? It's like throwing a little bit of like baits here and there. And that's like the most important thing. And then, he, and then Harvey dies for it. Another example is like the same clip, same clip. Um, let me just find the timestamp. I think it was like... So if you... Pool. So at 5.34, can you go to 5.34? Let's look at it from the... from Harvey's point of view, right? Can you play the clip? Uh, can you go back like 10 seconds or 5, if you can? Yeah, that's fine. So, in this position, Harvey has center. He has layer kind of trapped in the corner, and it's it's really pog, right? But this is the difference between the two. So if you look at this, like, play the clip. Look at Harvey. He does a fair, super safe. He spot dodges, jabs, spot dodges, F tilts, layer spot dodges, he jumps, and he gets he gets caught by the, by the up B. This is all in 0 0.25 speed. If you kind of look at this at normal speed, it kind of looks like a lot of like spaghetti. It's really, really quick. But the point I'm trying to make is that this is just like Harvey committing, right? It might not seem like like very much, but he doesn't need to. First off, he d after the fair, he doesn't need to commit to those jabs, right? He doesn't even need to kind of like sit in layer's shield and like kind of force jab mix-ups, right? He like decides to commit to a jab, maybe just to like win an RPS, but that RPS doesn't even need to be played. Can you can you pause when Yeah, pause, 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 pause. So he can kind of just like maintain stage, and just throw needles, kind of like throw fares. He can do a lot. But what he does is that he just commits up close to to a scramble and he loses stage for that. Right? Can you now go to 605? This is like another instance, right? Six or, yeah, 603 is fine. Look at this. So Harvey goes for an edge guard. I won't critique the edge guard itself because I think that was like, it's kind of like a smart player, you're chic. But look at this. So pause. He misses the edge guard. He gets, pause, 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 pause. He misses the edge guard, but he gets, he gets back to the ledge. What he could do is he could just like back off, right? He could jump, bouncing fish away, he could roll and still be, still have the center of the stage before Leo does. But what he does is that he goes for like a down air read, right? To, it's like a really high committal thing, and he spot dodges afterwards, and Leo's like, okay, lol, I'm just gonna down on you. Your ass is dead, right? He dies twice. 
or he, he gets punished twice and one time he dies for it because he decides to go for this mix-up that he didn't need to go for and he could have just backed off and get center right now you might you might argue like this might just be a chic thing because chic stubby right the clips we used were like Violist having like massive range and did he have a banana chic I don't know so I'll kind of show you another example, right? Can you get out of this? Go back to the slide. So this is Wizzy, right? This is Wizzy versus Mr. E. Um, so Wizzy gets grabbed and he gets thrown off, right? And then look at this. I'll just play the entire clip, play the entire clip, and then we'll go back. This is also a really hard matchup for Mario. Kind of like a lot of back and forth going on. But if you notice, every time Wizzy hits, he never he never bites more than he can chew. Right? And he gets the kill off this as well. It's really cool. It's a good ledge ledge trap. Boom, he dies. Can you go back to the clip now? I just wanted you to get like an idea of like the, the flow of that entire stock, right? Um could you go further back a bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this. So, notice the up air. Can you just play it at zero point like two five or something? Yeah. Go back a little bit. Sorry if this is like if you. This is kind of boring, but ah, this this was really pog in my mind. But notice, so he does this back air, right? What does he do? Runs away, right? Look at this. Pause. If you saw. Mr. E narrowed his shield, right? Nair super safe, but he doesn't decide to, he doesn't go for any hard mix up in the scramble, right? Even though it's like favorable for Mario, arguably. What he does, he just drifts, just drifts away and he just charges Flood, tries to get Mr. E back off stage. High, like, low risk choices. Dashes back, dashes in. Baits an option, does a back air, and he drifts drifts away, right? Now he's like kind of like in a very bad position here because he kind of I think he tried to like short hop the back air, but anyways, notice this he gets through, gets hit for this. The examples comes up comes up later, but it's fine. Um, he tries to go for a back air, and he gets a nair. So he drifts the nair away. Not only that, here, he does a roll, and Mr. E budges. Alright, this is where I can finally actually like explain my point. He gets one hit, right? Does a nair, drifts, drifts away. He's always just prioritizing the stage, and he gets another hit very soon, like a backer. But he's always just drifting away. He's so, like, what's the word? Not greedy, or like, he's so disciplined in prioritizing the center and even though there are instances where i'm like he could have like gotten way more than what he did get right but he like the point is that he doesn't go for these like high risk like chances he doesn't go for like the like he doesn't go for a risk where it's like he could potentially end mr e's stock off one combo right but the risk is losing like losing the advantage state He's always just playing like very safe, um, kind of like he's like making very safe choices, like low risk kind of good reward, um, choices, and he like he gets a stock off that. What I'm trying to like point out is that even if they're like matchups, right, where you're you're just significantly outranged, right, you can still position yourself well enough to kind of maintain the center. And it's really hard for the opponent, right? In Mr. E's case, and I've I've actually like personally experienced this because I've played Dark Wizzy and I've been in that position where I'm like, even though I'm outranging him, being in the corner is just so terrible. It's like so hard for me to like make a make an appropriate choice. And all the time, like I'll be real, I prey on the opponent over committing when they have center stage. And that's my cue to get out. That's how a lot of lower level matches go. And if the person that has center plays plays the odds better, then they 
probably win a lot more games. Essentially, that's just me rambling on about keeping stage control, but I think you get the gist of it. So yeah, can you... Next slide. Now, we've talked about like keeping stage control, the benefits, etc. Cetera, et cetera. How do you regain um, stage? I actually had an example in mind, but then I forgot to put it in the slide. That's okay. So when you're... When you don't have station control, right, you're in the corner. It's like really scary, but you have to keep in mind that it's not really it's not over yet, right? There are still ways to get out, so you can jump over them, you can roll through them, you could if you think that they're not going to commit, you can kind of react to when they do, and you can attack them, and you can just chill. There are there are actually quite a few things you can do, right? But the point is that. Even though you're at a disadvantage in terms of the number of options and like life seems really hard, it's it's not it's not over yet, right? And using the stage to like using the stage given to you is really key. I think a lot of the time, I'll, people would kind of like dash like I don't know I know from my, from experience when I'm Lucina and I have stage, right? I do like a bunch of nares and shit, right? I don't know why I have a hard one for that move, and then I get dash attacked for it. And the, pers the person just uses their burst option in the corner, right? That's an example of them waiting for me to commit to an option, right? And they just, like, choose the appropriate option, etc. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that is like, even though it's really hard, you still have options. Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's like, I think, if I think about it, it's like, when Nick, when I play extra, he's really good at baiting the opponent. So... What Nick would do is, if he finds himself on the on the corner of the stage, and I'm really sorry, I don't have an example for you, but just so you can hear me ramble. When he's in the corner, he kind of is really good at just not budging. He doesn't really commit. Because he knows that the opponent, um, who's worse than them, is most likely going to get a bit impatient, and they're going to kind of drift a little bit too close for comfort. And that's when you can kind of make a, make a choice right, of how to get through them. And he does a well-timed roll, and then now he has it, now he has center, and then everything goes to shit, and then you lose for like the seventh time. It's really frustrating. But the point I'm trying to make is that you still have some time, right? You don't need to always freak out and decide, be like, okay, I'm going to do something now. It's like, even though it's hard, yeah, you, you have to play with the options given to you. It's kind of like still an RPS is what I'm trying to say. Um, I think you guys, I think hopefully you guys understand what I'm trying to say. Let's move on to the next slide. All right, we're at the end. So this is like a summary of kind of everything I wanted to talk about, right? Um, so stage control alters the amount of options a person has at a given time. Kind of like thinking about the game as in like, who has more options than what? Who has the priority of like, think, like anticipating less options, et cetera, et cetera. And the objective is to just maintain center. It's probably the most important thing I want people to get out of is that you don't need to commit when you have the center of the stage. You can just kind of chill there and just throw out very low risk moves, right? Or you can just dash back or you can create lots of baits. The point is you don't need to do that snake dash attack at the corner of the, like to hit them at the corner of the ledge when you don't need to, you know? And yeah. If you lose stage, don't panic. You can still regain it by being patient and mixing up the ways you get through. And yeah, it's like, try to think about it as like risk reward, you know. If you want to commit to an interaction, is it really worth the chance of losing the stage? And that's a huge, yeah, like, it's a huge concept that people need to think. Sometimes it's good to kind of, you know, choose choose that, like, commitment. If, you, if you're really behind, all right, and you're like Mario, Maybe it's maybe it's worth going for that grab and getting that kill off it. Even though you might lose stage and you might slowly die, sometimes that's a risk you have to take. So it's it's quite contextual. But yeah. For the most part, it's probably better to prioritize stage. But anyways, I think I rambled way, way too much. But yeah, that's kind of the gist of it. Hope you guys enjoyed. Was this recorded? Uh, I think so, yeah, it was. Yes, it was. Uh, yeah. 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 Is there a noodle page on this as well? Bruh. Uh, I didn't. Yeah, there's I a noodle page as well. But, um, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, actually, never mind. Oh, nice. Yeah, there's a noodle page. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh,
That was sick. Uh, Any questions? Well anyone? Anyone? Like? Oh, yeah, I'm ask. free to answer. I think there's a little bit of Mario inside of us all in that situation. <laughs> going, going for that, I guess. For that grab? Yes. Yeah. You're not hitting them because you feel like you should, but because you want to. Yeah. It's like you have to hold back a bit, you know? I know I definitely, like, do that a lot. I'm just like, I just want to hit them, bro. Like, but then yeah. they time a, a good escape, and you're like, ah, oh, well, shit. And it's just very much like Australian thing because, like, we're known as the, the nation that just holds forward. I actually like, had, like, I had an example, right, of Dark Wizzy versus Ben Gold. Oh, no, 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 it wasn't Dark Wizzy versus, it was Dark Wizzy versus Sepro. But then I just didn't put it in because <clears throat> I thought of it way too late. But yeah, if you look at any, like, Sydney Smash game with Dark Wizzy in it, and you kind of just see, like, him just chilling in the middle of the stage. And then Australia's kind of panicking. They're like, what is he doing? Holy shit. <laughs> He's so good at this game. I mean, his two biggest points after Phantom was for people to hold stage and stop like up. and stop holding forward. So like, yeah. just th throughout this entire thing, especially when you brought up the Dark Wizzy stuff, I was like <laughs> thinking of that tweet the whole time. So. I think, yeah, I deliberately brought up Dark Wizzy because yeah. he's such a... Him and the Buzz are arguably like the biggest abusers, I reckon. Everything that they do is just for center. It's it's pretty nuts. <laughs> and then Leo as well. Kind of like, yeah, it's, it's pretty nuts. Um, I sort of got a question. Yeah, yeah, go for it. I sometimes, like, I guess it is sort of a habit, but sometimes I sort of intentionally drift to the edge because I sort of, like, feel like I'm more advantageous, advantageous at the edge. But I guess that's also the same thing as giving off stage control, which can, like, be bad as well. So I'm not really sure like, what to sort of think about that in terms of like strategy. Well, I think that, well, first off, right, your character is kind of like an exception, right, to the average. They have really good tools for capping, like Hydrant's really good. You have the threat of charging, charging fruit. So I don't think on face value, doing what you do is bad inherently, right? Or like, is, is like objectively bad. I think a lot of the time, people are guilty of kind of over committing to Pac-Man when he's kind of in a corner. And that's kind of where you get a lot of mileage, if I'm safe to assume, right? And that's kind yeah, of like, that's yeah. what kind of conditions you to do that. You feel like it's pretty good. And if that if it works, it works, you know? Like, if you know that that's a method in which you can bait the opponent, then I reckon it's good. But you yeah. have, to, I think the most important thing is every time you do that, please just consider the the potential that the opponent could just suffocate you right they won't commit and they can kind of just like poke you when like when you're in the corner and then when you get hit now you're off stage and yeah that, that's what i'm thinking about as well and then like it's sort of like device the double edge sort of that is whenever i do go stage control i just have no idea what to do <laughs> so like right i guess that's the bad thing yeah well when you do have stage it's like i think if you kind of want to like simplify the, like what you have to think about just think about kind of like holding a zone it's kind of like domination in cod <laughs> or like a hard point if you king of the hill yeah, yeah. king of the hill you kind of want to like keep that position right eventually they will have to come to you and if they if they're not budging you can kind of like bait things out right the point the concept of like game of anticipating options is like the person with center stage can kind of like bait you, and you and the person that doesn't have center stage doesn't really know whether it's bait or not, so they're more likely to commit to something. So if you can bait them to commit to commit in a in a way in which you can punish it, then that's yeah, that's that's pretty good. I think that's kind of what the objective. I think. Yeah. Maybe like as Pac Man, you can kind of like move in, move out, move in, move out, and they're like, is he gonna grab me? Is he gonna like forward air me? Should I jump over them? And then they jump over you. And now you're above them, and you can charge bell. And then when they land, you throw the bell, and then you kill them. You know, yeah. or you can, yeah. Hey, it, I, does that answer? Yeah. That's yeah. So, does that answer your question, Jerry? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this one is like not necessarily for myself, but it's probably something that I hear. Like a lot of mid-level players will have will have problems with this, right? So say I'm playing like a swordy. And I've got center stage, and I'm playing against some zoner. So like, 
We Fit, Samus, Mewtwo, and... Wait, wait, sorry, sorry, could you repeat? Alright, so say yes. I'm playing yep. a Swordy, yep. right? So, yep. like, a Lucina or an Ike or something, and I'm playing against a Zona, so, like, a Samus, a Young Yink. Link, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yink, alright? And they're in the corner? And they're in the corner, right? So, what I want to do is stand, like, is not commit, because I want to bait them into coming for center, eventually. Right, you you kind of lagged a bit. Sorry, what you so, what you kind of want to do is so what I want to do is not play too committal. I want to um, just stand in the center, wait for them to come to me. Right. Yeah. So what happens if the Yink just shoots arrows? Right. That's a really good question. And uh, what that's... if Samus is you know doing charge shot, or the Pac Man is charging up Bell? They're or... they're chill. Like yeah, what if they're yeah. turns, right? And yeah, they're exactly. forcing interactions from a mm -hmm. from a safe distance, and it's really it's really annoying. That's a really 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 good question, and I wish we had an example for that, but alas, we don't. I would okay. So I think it's like really hard to like think about it in the sense that arrow is a commitment, but in actuality, right? Every move is kind of like a commitment, and there's a spacing where they can be punished, right? Well, I think let's imagine like. Let's imagine Yink, and you're like, I don't know, you're like, Bart, Bart, Lucina, right? Mm -hmm. They're corner, cornering themselves on the stage, okay, right? Zoda. They're like, you, you'd like to think, you know, being a, an avid um, supporter of the fundamentals of the game, be like, they're at a disadvantage, they should be losing. Um, but they keep hitting me, right? I think what you need to do is you need to kind of slowly close the gap, because against these characters, right, they have so much range, and it's like they can kind of play at a safer distance, right? And it's 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 a bit scary. But you have to like essentially you have to kind of close the gap without trying to hard commit, right? Essentially, they will you will reach a you will reach a kind of position where if they choose to throw an arrow, right, they have to be fully prepared of getting hit because Let's say that you're at roll distance, right? If if you kind of imagine yourself as the Yink and you shoot arrow, you don't know whether they're gonna jump over it or not. It's it's not reactable and it's not safe, right? That's in the kind of that's where you reach the realm of like um, anticipating things or like yeah, things no longer become reactable. And it's about kind of positioning yourself in that space where like at any point in time you can kind of like make one like choice to like beat their projectile and you and like i you can you can say that like oh aren't you doing a commitment right but the thing is if you kind of like position like you're like okay you're the blue guy right you're all you're in like a way better position than the person throwing the projectile because at, like you can kind of like just jump straight or jump backwards right and they don't. They can't really react until you are in the air, right? And they're in, they're in a scary position. And at any point in time, they could be fearful of you, like rolling through, or and like grabbing, grabbing, or like dash attacking the straight, straight up dash attacking you, right? Or like going in, going up to grabbing you. Usually, when you position yourself in in like this this space, they will just they will do something that's high committal, like a roll or like a go run up and grab. Right, because they've conditioned you to shield like the Yink arrow. That's that's what you need to be expecting, right? So it's like an RPS when you reach that stage. But it's not a fair RPS because you have options like jumping away that are just like so inherently like or well, way more advantageous and way more safer than what they do. And if they get and the the role like the risk reward of them choosing an option and losing is like Way worse. Uh, does that like kind of explain it? It's like you have to kind of close the gap uh, to CLDR. Yeah. Um, the thing that I meant was not necessarily like how to analyze it in terms of like objectively, I can jump away because it's safer and I have more stage to jump away from, right? What I mean is more like you often find a lot of, you know, low to mid-level players who play zoners and are just very comfortable in the corner, right? Mm. So, like, even if I 
jump away, right? Or like, say I'm like you know your like your average like mid level player, and I jump away. I don't feel like I've done anything. I've just reset to neutral, right? But and because my opponent is very comfortable in the corner, they're like that type of player that you know. They are, you feel the like there's no reason for them to come to you? Yeah, so they aren't going to come to me because they don't feel that way, right? Yeah. So they don't feel that they need center. So right. then what's going to happen next in the match is just that um, I am going to walk or you know, move closer to the corner because that's where they are. It's the only way to progress the match. Right, right. I feel like so, in those instances, right. Sorry, keep going, keep going. Yeah. So, for the for the sorty guy, it often feels like, um, yes, they have this safe option of like you know they can jump out, so like they can jump back or not commit. But the point is that not committing just resets the situation, so that I have to make the same choice again. Right. Right. And so the, the point is that eventually, assuming that they're going to stand there, um, you have to commit. I have to commit. So that means that even though I have stage control, I am eventually the one who has to commit, rather right. than the projectile user. Right. So okay. well, well, doesn't that go against the idea of stage control? I'd probably say that yes. I think it, like the way you pointed out, kind of like goes against the idea that you don't need to commit. Right. But I think the reason why a lot of low-level players struggle in those instances, right, it's because they don't really understand, like, the actual, like, like the, the, the benefit of, like, the posi- like of, like, being in this position that, like, like, in, in the position Connor's kind of pointed out in the slide. Like, when you're close to them, right, I feel like, yes, it does feel like a commitment when you're spacing close to them. Let's say that it, okay. Let's say that it is a commitment, right? Like it's an RPS whether like they grab your shield or like you jump over the grab or like they anti air you, etc., etc., etc. It's like a commitment, and you have to kind of like um, go with it. First off, the risk reward or, of that commitment is heavily skewed in your favor, right? That's that's kind of like a universal like that's kind of like a concept that stage control will always kind of grant you, like no matter what, right? It's just way better being the person that's behind the stage. Sorry, that, that has the stage behind them than being the person on the corner. Because, you know, if, if you guess right, then they're off stage and it's really scary, right? Um, another thing is that being in that space is not as big of a commitment for you than it is for the person that's throwing the projectiles, right? But you have, like, you can space this... Mm, you can kind of like position yourself like I don't know how to explain this, but the person throwing the projectile, the moment they see you go close to a point where it's like a commitment, quote unquote, they're it's no longer reactable for them, right? And that's when that's the that's the instance where you need to bait it out. And because yeah. you're baiting it out and you're not actually committing to that to an interaction, right? But you're going to go you're kind of going close to that space. It's really scary for you, the person on the corner, right? And it doesn't matter if they have, they have a projectile or not. It's something that is like inherently disadvantageous for them. Does that make more sense? Yeah, that's the answer I wanted. Like, yeah. <laughs> okay. You're just looking for an. <laughs> I guess. I think it's like really hard to kind of grasp it without like an actual yeah. example. Well, That's I already I understood really... it, no, no, personally. I was yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. But it's like really hard. It's that's why it's like probably really good to like look at how certain people deal with it. And I think that's why other players, like other like Americans, don't rate or like Japanese players, like don't rate Young Link as highly as like we as like I do, for example, or like some Australians do. Partially because Jay Dizzle is like the best player in the country, but also because. Americans, like, their priority is stage, and their spacing is really good and really disciplined. So the character kind of struggles more, as opposed to a meta where everyone's quote-unquote holding forward. So, yeah. It's kind of like a little insight, I think. Yeah, anyone else have any questions? Oh, 
also, was the audio all fine and everything? Yeah. 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 yeah is, is my audio like, like good? Do have a high pitched noise coming out of your mic? Oh, someone should have. Really someone should have like missed. Like, I mean, you've, me. you've had that problem for quite some time anyway. I think it's, yeah. it's yeah. inconsistent. It it because sometimes, it sometimes it's on, sometimes it's not on. Oh, is that honest? Yeah, yeah. it's always on. Oh, so, yeah. Well, it's not like... Yeah. I realized it's like my my microphone, and if I twist it in a certain way, then it will get the high, high ringing noise. But, um... Usually that's the case yeah. of audio stuff. Wait. Mm. I can noise... Well, I mean, we can't hear it now. <laughs> well, he's <Yeah>. definitely. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, um, if anyone, like, yeah. if no one else has questions, let's just wrap it up, right? Yeah. 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 Finish up the well recording. done, Ernest. Thank you. Thank you, for, Ernest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, flip lecture. Yeah, this is the first one. Two and a half um, pages of notes. I'm proud. Nice. Yeah, nice. yeah, so speaking of notes, um, when I'm like finished uploading the recording or whatever, I'm going to upload a resource pack of some sort into announcements and that will contain our original brainstorm, summary notes, um, the recording itself, and the links to all the examples and stuff like that uh, that Ernest and I went through in creating this. Um, we just make a channel for resources. That way it doesn't get lost in announcements. True. Yeah, I think that's better. Oh, maybe chuck it into Learn to Play or something and pin yeah, it. Yeah. Um, no, 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 call it game number one, zero. Yeah, it's similar to a lot of how, like, the character chords have a specific section for resources, yeah. and it's like, you can only, like, only... Yeah. I think Learn to Play should be, like, a Q&A thing, and then uh, we have a separate channel for, like, mm -hmm. these types of resources that, yeah. like, only admins or something can post it. Do we just call it Moodle? Like, or, like, cool. J JM Moodle? So cool. JM Moodle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, but anyway, that was, that was our first episode of Learn to Play. JML lecture. Um, if you, if any of you guys have any kind of like feedback, criticism, um, please, please message me about it. Uh, cause obviously I want to make this the best experience possible. Um, I don't know when the next one will be. It might be a weekly thing. It might be once every two weeks. Um, if you guys have any ideas on topics that you want to be covered, also message me. And if you maybe want to host a lecture yourself, also message me. Um, uh, cause I'll be getting around to that eventually. Uh, but Do anyway. Do you have a second lecture nice. lined up, Connor? Or Not currently lined up, no, but no. I have the next person in mind I want to go to. So who is it? Well, you have to oh, wait oh, till next week, oh, won't man. you? Oh, yeah. Next week, oh. the next year, no. See you yeah. yeah. this weekly. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. Hanger. I don't know. What about it... a hint? <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> a really <laughs> abstract Mask, hint. Mask singer esque. <laughs> we'll just have to wait. Like um, I'm gonna yeah. end the recording here yeah. then. So thanks again for watching. Yeah. Hello, guys.